Good evening. If you will, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Randy was a little caught off guard when I had Daniel up there because we know we're covering that on Wednesday. Uh, this will be my third uh, time in the book of Daniel this week. Uh, Wednesday class, we were in Daniel. Uh, Thursday of last week with the young adults, we talked about Daniel and adulting. Uh, making that transition from being with family at a young age to starting to take responsibilities on their own and talk a little bit about that. And so as I was thinking more about Daniel, the thing that came to mind is, is that uh, in Daniel, we also get a lot about leadership. So what I'd like to talk about tonight is uh, leadership God's way, focusing on Daniel chapters one and two. So beginning there in Daniel chapter 2, and reading verses 1 through 7. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep had left him. Then the king gave uh, the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to tell them the king, to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. And the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. Verse 6. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Verse 7. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. Now, Kara, let's go back a few years. How would you feel if the superintendent came up to you and said, Karen, if we don't make 90% in our testing this year, you're going to be cut into pieces, and your whole household is going to be turned into an ash heap? Or, Andy, how would you feel if when you were out with Child Protective Services, if they told you that, Andy, every time you go to court, if you don't win to protect that child, then, Andy, we're going to cut you to pieces, and your home would be a heap. At one time, many years ago, that leadership style was very much the way things took place. And that leadership style at times has its place. But here you have a king who has a dream. He's losing sleep. He's distraught. Can't focus. A lot of anxiety building up. And he demands that those people that serve him give him the answer. And what does that cause for the people that are serving him? What he calls the people that are serving him to do is to kind of come up with a way to not really follow through with their jobs, but actually to come up with a way that they can give him a lie, a false answer, right, so that they're not going to be killed. So one, he's putting so much pressure on him, saying, if you don't get this for me, I'm going to kill you. Have you ever felt like you work for somebody that way? Have you ever felt somebody making demands that way to you? I've been there. And that's why I'm in the valley. I worked for a man back in 1999 where you had to know everything about state probation, backwards, forwards, upside down, and he would grill you. And at times, my chief knew more than my judges. And I never knew how safe my job was going to be. My job was only as safe as his bad mood. 
Had I wanted to, I would have stayed in George West had he not been my chief. And I'd have worked there for 40 years. I'd have retired in George West as a supervising probation officer for the state, and I would have been fine. But I had a, a man who threatened me continuously with my job day in and day out. And I got one evaluation in five years. One evaluation in five years. What kind of control was that? Well, I never knew whether my job was being done well or not. And when I left, when I, when I finally decided that, that I got, well, I'd been offered this job down here, and when I finally left, we actually had a staff meeting that last day that I was leaving. And when we got to the meeting, when the meeting was over, he announced Raleigh was going to be leaving today. Then he did something that was just amazing. He said about two or three things that were really nice about me. And in five years, I never heard a single thing that I had done well. And I was in shock that he actually acknowledged that I did decent work. I thought it was good work, but it only seemed like decent work to him. But nonetheless, had he done that over the five years, you probably never would have met me. But that wasn't God's plan. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about tonight is worldly leadership versus godly leadership. You might be asking yourself, well, why do we need to know that? We've got elders that are, that are going to be worried about the spiritual responsibility of the congregation in making decisions. That's what the Bible says. You have deacons that are assigned to carry out certain works within the church to make sure that the church is physically maintained. The Bible talks about preachers who are to preach God's word. Then we have evangelists who assist in going out and reaching out to the community. And then, in this physical side of it, we, we probably hire somebody to keep up with secretarial work, the day-in, day-out activities within the church to keep it running. If you're a really big congregation, you might have somebody that does maintenance in the congregation. And so, the Bible lays out what the leadership should look like. And especially, if you're a woman, you may be wondering, well, what does this have to do with me because of how sometimes that's approached or thought of, right? That women in a leadership role. But I think that's false in every single way. I go back to Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes where it talks about certain principles that we live by. And then it says, at the very end, because of these principles, you're going to be persecuted. And it talks about being the salt and the light of the earth. And we have a choice. We all have a choice. As the Spirit works in us through God's Word to make those changes within us, the Bible says you are going to be the salt and the light of the earth. And then it warns us and says you can't take the light and put it under a basket and hide it. That's not what it's for. Open it up. Put it on the hill. Let it shine bright. Mighty soul, have you thought about your leadership role now as you're coaching junior high students? How important your leadership role is going to be? Olivette, the, I mean, Crystal, the, the guidance that you're going to prepare young mothers for in this world as they're getting ready to have children? Matt, the direction that you point to make sure that Pavements and, and sidewalks and infrastructure is done correctly so that people don't die and parking lots don't fall apart. Every single one of us is a leader in some way or another. Or, or you decided not to be the salt and the light. And what do the scriptures tell us about that? If the salt loses its flavor... What good is it? And so we have to continue to think about God's word, focus on living God's word every single day, and think about the responsibility that we have with God's word and how we lead people 
to come to know God. Well, by the way, if you're a father, a mother, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, you've been leading for quite some time now. Been leading your household. Been leading your family. But there's a way that the world does it, as we see here in Nebuchadnezzar, who is making threats and telling people, if you don't do it and get me the results that I want, I'm cutting you into pieces. Now, I don't care which side you, you vote nowadays, but tell me that's not what we're seeing all over television day in and day out. I, I don't even like watching television because it's doom and gloom every day. Either way, you're seeing it. We're going to get back at you. No, no, we're going to get back at you. No, we're going... That, that is a leadership style that we are seeing today in our community day in and day out. And Nebuchadnezzar is leading that style as well. Daniel, if mine serves me correctly, Randy said, when he's taken into captivity, he's probably between the ages of 15 and 19. And when we talked about our young adult classes, most of our young adults are going to be between 20 and 30, right in that area. We'd love to get to that age, right, where we graduated high school, and now we have to start making those decisions on our own. But Daniel didn't have that opportunity. At a very young age, he was taken captive. And then things started for him. Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 reads, And the king instructed uh, Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, a young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Several points that show up here. What was the king looking for? What kind of talent was he looking for in the people that he took captive? That they were gifted in wisdom, that they possessed knowledge, quick to understand. Are they teachable? Can they pick up what they're training them on quickly? They had the ability to serve. In other words, they weren't going to be lazy. They weren't going to fall down on the job, but they were going to be productive. And whom they might teach. I think the teachability is probably one of the most important things that we have when we talk about leadership. Is somebody teachable? But he mentions three things here. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Proverbs 22, 17 says, my title says, Sayings of the Wise. It says, incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge. As I've told you before, when I go to George West, I turn my vehicle off, I park it, and I've got no desire to get back in that thing until I'm ready to leave. I recognize that my family, my parents, mom and dad, have got some wisdom that I need to absorb as much as I can. I've got knowledge and I've got understanding of certain things and I may have knowledge and understanding of things that maybe they don't. But they can still teach me how to take that understanding and knowledge and turn it into wisdom. Or they've already done that. But I haven't seen the process because I didn't know any better when I was younger. But now when I sit around the table and have conversations with them, guess what? I start to understand that. And I got to drive here last week, a couple of ladies in my vehicle, to McAllen, absorb some wisdom. Got to drive to Harlingen, absorb some wisdom. I get to sit down with Andy and Van every once in a while and have breakfast. And guess what I'm doing? Absorbing some wisdom. We have to take the time to focus on continuously learning, picking up knowledge, gaining understanding, and turning that into wisdom. Knowledge <laughs> defined as what is learned. It's a familiarity with the facts or certain subjects. Knowledge typically deals with factual information, 
you have learned from school, books, or other experts. Anybody ever know that person that read everything? You ever have that boss or that co-worker that just read everything for no other purpose than to know everything? Who that when you started talking about pink shoelaces, they knew the history of pink shoelaces, why they were a certain diameter, why they were as long as they were, but the only purpose of that person was to have that knowledge to sound smart. So it is important that we have knowledge, but we've got to do something with it. We've got to take it in a certain direction. Wisdom. Is a noun defined as the ability to know what is true or right. To have common sense or the collection of one's knowledge. It goes beyond facts and requires pulling together knowledge and personal experiences. It's good to have knowledge, but I have to get out there and experience life. I have to take my lumps, both good and bad, and start to learn from that and how to apply that knowledge. That starts to become wisdom. How good do you think your wisdom is going to be if you just sit back and don't put yourself out there? Where does that go? If that had said, you know what? I'm going to let all those other men die. I'll wait to the very end. And then I'll go ahead and, and answer the king. What if he just sat back and did nothing? But he put himself out there, right? Not just once, not just as we read in 1 and 2, but we see down the road that he puts himself out there time and time again. And so without putting ourselves out there, wisdom doesn't develop. And without really focusing on the knowledge that you have and how it applies to things, common sense may not come. And sometimes it just seems like some people can't ever get common sense. But if you take the time to ask them questions, if you're curious about them, you start to understand that maybe they just think a little bit different than you do. And the common sense really is there. But you have to gain an understanding of where it is that they come from and how they apply that. You see, demanding it, as Nebuchadnezzar did, may not get you the best results. Understanding, Proverbs 18.2 reads, A fool has no delight in understanding, but expressing his own heart. A fool has no delight in understanding, but expressing his own heart. These are the people who are going to rattle things off without asking questions, without thinking about what they're saying. They see things and they see it through tunnel vision and they're going to respond without really getting to know the whole situation and the scenario. Nebuchadnezzar has got a dream. He's got a dream. He doesn't know what it is. And the only way he can feel that he can get to the answer by making that threat. Rather than to sit and ask people, do we have anybody who's talented enough to interpret this dream? Is there any way that we can get this resolved without me having to kill 20 people? Nebuchadnezzar just says, this is what I'm ruling on. This is the way we're going forward. So it's important that we gain understanding. Understanding could be an adjective or a noun. As a noun, it's like the step between knowledge and wisdom. When you comprehend the information you learn, or knowledge, you understand it. When you understand the knowledge and learn to apply it to decision making, you gain wisdom. Now Daniel begins to show pretty early on, there in verse 5 through 8, the type of leadership that he has and where it's rooted. The first point on that leadership is we must focus on what is from God. Talked about this morning, they all walked in one accord. What is that accord? They all walked in focusing on worshiping God and carrying out His will. And so the same thing goes for us. In our leadership, we need to focus on what is from God. In Daniel 1, beginning in verse 5 and going through 8, it says, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies 
and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. In verse 8 reads, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he may not defile himself. Going back. First point is, focus on what is from God. Daniel had an opportunity to eat of the best food, probably to drink of the best wine, to receive some of the best training. And if all that worked out for him, if he took advantage of all of that, right, we would think that the better you eat, the better you're trained, the better you drink of water or whatever soda, whatever's healthy for you, then the better off you're going to be. But Daniel had already known what God had provided. And he knew how healthy he was and how much healthier he would be if he focused on only what God provided. And so although Nebuchadnezzar offered the best for them, he decided, and our next point is this, purposing his heart. He purposed his heart to only eat and drink those things that would make him healthier, that would make him better, to serve out God's purpose and will. So these two go hand in hand. First, focus on what God gives us, and then secondly, make sure that we're purposely in our heart continuously to remain focused and to continue to push forward and serving and carrying out God's will. Now, how does that apply to us every day? What have we been offered? Come hang out this evening at happy hour. Get to know the boss. That happen? Oh, if, if you just stay here on Wednesday night and work a few extra hours, or come in on the weekends, come in on Sunday, we're going to get you that promotion. If you decide to work Sundays all day, We'll give you some more per dim money. And on top of that, we'll add $5 an hour to your check. How does that start to look? How is that focus going? Now, I'm not telling you, don't work on Sundays. Sometimes we just can't work around that. But we got to think about whether our heart's purposed or not. If I'm making $22 an hour on a Sunday, but yet I still get to make services and get to work afterwards, but they've offered me to make $30 an hour if I go in and work the whole day. What am I going to do? For a few dollars more. Am I purposing my heart? And am I trusting and remaining focused on what it is that God has given me? And so that's what Daniel shows us. And Daniel showed us good communication, right? He just did not eat of it. He didn't push it away. He didn't balk and, and when they threw it out, they, no, I'm not going to do that and get everybody riled up. He didn't even go up against Nebuchadnezzar, which I think was a smart choice. He had already established some rapport with the chief eunuch. And so he went to the chief eunuch and he requested. He didn't tell him. He didn't demand it. Have you heard today what's out there? We demand that you provide this information. I'm going to demand that you do this. It's been demanded. How far does that go? And when I keep hearing that at the higher levels, I demand, and then it doesn't happen. Before, if you demanded something, if my mom demanded something back in the day, it was happening. If not, there was a belt coming my way at some point. That was a demand. The demand was, it's going to happen. Nowadays, how many times have you heard a demand and it goes nowhere? People throw that word around like it's nothing. Why would you demand something if you know ultimately it's not going to happen? What does that make you look like? Especially if you're a leader. 
You can't demand something from somebody who works for you and they not follow through with it, right? Because that's insubordination. And guess what? Everybody else is watching you. And now they think they can get away with it. When we think about Daniel, he had good communication skills. He requested. He asked. Pulled them aside. Maybe gathered his thoughts. Thought about how he was going to approach that conversation. And requested from the eunuch. Can I continue to eat the way that we've eaten? Daniel chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. I have to walk the walk. After the chief eunuch agrees to allow them to eat, the chief eunuch goes up for requests. And the chief eunuch says, I understand what you're telling me, Daniel. And I trust in you that you're going to be stronger, that you're going to be healthier, that you'll be able to come through. But I am concerned, I am concerned that if you don't come through, the king's going to have my head. The king's going to come back at me. The godly leadership, let your yes be yes and your no be no, right? And so if I tell you I'm going to do something, as a Christian, I need to follow through. If I don't follow through, that becomes a lie, doesn't it? And so it's better off at some point where I just say, my answer is no, but if it changes... I'll circle back with you. Why? Because then nobody's got no expectation on me. And if I can do it at some point and I go back, when they understand that I had a change in of heart, I had a change in of mind, or the ability to get that done is now there. Why am I going to tell somebody, yes, I can do it, when I probably know in my heart that it's not going to get done because I'm spread too thin or I'm overwhelmed or overworked? And so Daniel walks the walk. Verse 12, he says, Please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let your appearance be examined, then let our appearance be examined before you. And the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies, as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who had ate the portion of the king's delicacies. And then verse 18 culminates here. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them to Nebuchadnezzar. I'm wrapping this up into another one. Let me go back here. So they had to walk the walk. They made the claim to the chief eunuch that they would be healthier. And when we make that claim as Christians, we have to make sure that we follow through. That's God in leadership. And so not only did they say, give us what we want to eat, but they said, test us. And so they went through the test, and they found that they were ten times, ten times better than everyone else. It goes back to focusing on what God gives us, and it goes back to purposing our hearts. Then in verse 18, it says, Now at the end of the days, when the king said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in, the mat in all the matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. And so one thing that we see here is that they had endurance. If you're serving as a Christian, if you're out doing the work that God puts before us, that work's not going to end. The more people that you want to save, the busier you're going to be. The more you want to fellowship with Christians, the busier you're going to be. The more you want to help people in their weaknesses, the busier you're going to be. 
if we are going to be Christians and serve the way we're asked to serve, if we're going to mimic, as we talked about this morning, what the first century church looked like, you are going to be tired. We're going to need endurance. And God provides that endurance. He provides exactly what it is that we need. And we talk about, a couple of lessons back, we talked about being prepared. And so we're called to be prepared in season and out of season. And Daniel stepped up to the plate. You see, he wasn't planning on being kidnapped and taken away. But even when he was, he stayed focused on God's will and what God had showed him. And at the young age of 15, maybe at 17, 18, his leadership skills were already developing. And he maintained that endurance through fear. He continued to focus on what God put before him, and he built up that endurance to get through things. And on top of that, he was prepared in season and out of season. When this difficult time came, Daniel was ready to leave. And here's the thing that we've got to understand about that. Kelly, every time we get out of bed and we put our foot on the floor, what are we prepared for? Should be prepared to leave. We should be expecting that somebody's going to come to us today and want to know about God's Word. Somebody's going to come to us today and they're going to need help. Somebody's going to come to us today and they're going to be having struggles in this world. Somebody's going to come to us today and put something so heinous before us. It's going to challenge us to the bone to understand how we should handle that. Andy, you ever had that happen to you? Crystal, you ever seen that? Mighty soul as a coach with those young kids being exposed to that? Life happens. We're called to be prepared in season and out of season. Daniel, at the young age of 15, was prepared. I think back what I would have done at the age of 15. I think I would have curled up in a corner like a baby with my thumb in my mouth and I would have cried. Well, I would have got through it, I think, at some point. But having my own understanding as opposed to God's wisdom and God's understanding of leadership, I'm sure that's the way I would have felt. There's a certain determination that we have to have to be leaders God's way. It's not just going to happen. There has to be effort. There has to be concern. There has to be a desire. You know what's interesting? You go to churches nowadays, most of them have a group of men that get together and make decisions. A lot of them will lean on the preacher to make those decisions. You know what the main problem that we're having within the church? Establishing elders. One is having men that qualify. But number two is finding people that have a desire to serve in that position. They're not prepared in season or out of season. Isaac will take care of it. Sebastian will take care of it when he turns 45. BJ is going to take care of that later on when he gets married. Easy for me to sit back and think about who's going to do it. I used to tell people in my office all the time, if you can't identify the leader three doors of you in either direction from your office, you need to get involved. We need to get involved. We need to be leaders. Not only here in our congregation, but every day where we step, we need to be leaders. We're called to be the salt and the light of the earth. Daniel gives us a perfect example of how to prepare ourselves to be that leader. We have to know the gifts of God. In Daniel 2.16, it says, So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Daniel understood that when the king started killing people off, 
The chief eunuch brought it to him and said, this is what's going to happen. We're here to kill you because nobody's interpreted this dream. And he asked him, he said, what's the urgency? What, what, what's going on? And the eunuch explained it to him. And he says, okay. He said, I'll take care of it. Why did he decide to take care of it? Does anybody know? Why did Daniel step up and say, I will take care of it? He knew he had to. He knew he had to. We'll go back. 1 in verse 17. It said, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Daniel was blessed. He had a different skill set and a blessing from God that other people did not. And when it came time, when it came time to put that to the test, when it came time to serve, when it came time to be a leader so that no other people would be killed, whether or not he knew he was going to get that answer, he had faith in God. He said, stop the killing. I'll take care of it. You and I have an opportunity to stop death every day. And people dying around us spiritually all day long. And you have a skill set. And I have a skill set. And I have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Because we are all teachable. We should all remain focused on God. But we all called to take what God has given us and to use it. To lead. So that we can stop death from coming to others. Daniel chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from God of heaven concerning the secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men from Babylon. See, Daniel had the gift. And Daniel understands that he's got the gift. But he understands that he's going to need help with this. And so he goes to them and says, let's seek the mercies of God. Let's reach out to him for understanding. Let's pray so that we can have this answer. He doesn't just say, I've got this because I've got this talent. He's leaning on other people to help him. And you remember that sermon I gave back in October when I decided to take this position. I said I was scared. But I trusted in each and every one of you. And it's your leadership each and every day that helps me to do my job better. I have certain trust in BJ, Sebastian, Andy, Kelly, each and every one of you. There are certain things that I trust because I understand talents. I understand blessings from God that you have. That gives me confidence. I know who to seek out when I've got different things that are difficult in life. Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. So, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and all the visions of your head upon your bed were these. And he begins to tell him. Daniel could have taken that honor. Daniel could have taken that responsibility from the king and said, I did this. But rather he turned and gave that glory to God. And Daniel thanks and praises God. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. 
and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. And so all glory is given to God. And Nebuchadnezzar begins to believe in him as well. You are to tell him. It says, and you reveal our secrets that you could reveal the secrets. So the king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is a God of gods. And so we have to remember to always give glory to God. When we focus on leading Daniel's way, other people will come to know God. They'll understand his power. And I want to get to this one because I think this one's extremely important. As you develop leadership skills, get better as a leader. As you get to a certain place because of what it is that God has put in you and allowed you to guide others, always remember this, Daniel 2.49. said, also Daniel petitioned the king, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province and of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the king and the gate of the king. And I left off a slide here. But when it was all said and done with and the king set him at that place, Daniel turned and asked that his friend would join him. And the king honored him. Colin Powell wrote the book that when you're leading, always stop and take a look behind you. And if you have people following you, you're still a leader. The day people quit bringing problems to you, you're no longer leading. Now you're just taking up space. Daniel pulled through for the king. The king blessed him. But rather than take all that to himself, he turned and remembered the guys that helped him to get it done. We all have that responsibility. Every day that we get out of bed, we need to think about our leadership. Every day that we get out of bed, we need to get better at what God has given us. Those talents, that understanding, that wisdom. So we can save and help others and stop that debt that will come to them. Godly leadership is much different than the worldly leadership that we see today and that we've seen over the years. It has changed drastically. We need to make sure that we're being godly leaders for God, that others may come to know. Jesus Christ, the greatest leader that's ever walked the face of this earth. And he came and he led the way he did, so you and I would come to know our Father in heaven. And Jesus Christ gives us that opportunity to be with God in heaven someday as he went to the cross. If you're not yet a child of God, the waters of baptism are ready for you. Maybe you haven't been leading. Maybe you've got other struggles in your heart. I invite you to come forward and stand and sing a song of invitation. When we walk.